Uh, our presentation today is by Richard Carter. Richard has spent more than 35 years working on various aspects of water management as a consultant and an educator and a researcher. Much of this time he was based at Cranfield University where he established a successful master's program in community water and sanitation and where he was appointed professor of international water development in 2002. In 2006, he set up his own consulting firm. He also acted as director of DFID's Resource Center for Environment, Climate Change, Water, and Sanitation prior to joining WaterAid as head of technical support in 2009. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management and a member of a number of other professional associations. He has published widely in the academic and practitioner literature. Richard is also chair of our uh, Rural Water Supply Network. So Richard will be talking to us today about the um, myths of rural water supply. Su Jung, would you now please take away my slides and bring out Richard's presentation? And Richard, I am muting my microphone and turning the floor over to you. Elizabeth, thank you very much for that and uh, welcome to everybody who is able to hear me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be kicking off this series and um, I'm looking forward to the whole series and, and particularly today I'm um, hoping for some good interaction both during and after the presentation. It's great to have such a, a, an international audience, that's, that's really brilliant. Welcome to you all. I want to um, address the, uh, the topic of rural water supply from a, a general point of view um, and think about some of the ways that we've been going about business in rural water for the last two or three decades and some of the ways that things perhaps need to change. The um, recent joint monitoring program report, which I'm sure you've all seen, um, claims that the water MDG target has been met uh, three years before the, um, or even five years before the uh, 2015 deadline, um, as the data in the most recent report relate to um, 2010. What we know, though, is that um, there, is, uh, there are a lot of challenges around sustainability. Um, low functionality, um, short half-life of um, systems which are installed um, and services which are going out of operation. And thankfully though what we are seeing is um, increased attention to rural water and particularly to issues around sustainable service provision. I want to just spend a few minutes um, talking about what I call the conventional approach to rural water supply, um, which is the approach that's pretty well dominated the way we go about business um, for the last 25 years or so. It really became established in the water decade of the 1980s um, and has not much changed since. It's very much focused on output, on um, meeting the um, Millennium Development Goal targets for coverage, um, which define service coverage as access to improved water points. Um, as you know, um, the improved water points that JMP identifies are those which deliver a protected supply of water, so one which is generally assumed to be relatively safe. Um, in this conventional approach and, and in the, the world that we see out there at the moment, um, something like uh, 1.3 billion people are reliant on boreholes and if you um, add in also those who are reliant on um, hand dug wells and water from springs, in other words all groundwater sources, um, it amounts to about 60% of 
people, rural people globally. Um, a second aspect of the conventional approach to rural water supply is that the capital costs are heavily subsidized, often fully to, to the tune of 100%, um, but where communities contribute labor and locally available materials and, and where that um, contribution, that input is monetized, it might amount to 10, 15% at the most. So it's very capital, um, it, very, very much emphasizing um, the subsidy on the capital investment. But having invested in the, um, in the fixed assets, the service is then handed over usually to communities to manage um, in, uh, in entirety. Usually a water user committee is set up to, to manage and maintain the water point um, and it is assumed that the water consumers will contribute all the financial requirements um, to look after that water point. We rarely address the issue of um, what happens when the, uh, the technology reaches the end of its design life, but the reality is that then it very often uh, falls into disrepair and, and is abandoned. Just a few observations on, on this approach. Um, when people are asked what sort of improvements to their, um, their services and their life that they're, they're interested in, they will often demand better water supply services. But equally, that rarely translates into um, a full willingness and ability to pay for the uh, corresponding service. And furthermore, we, we really don't know very well how to advise communities on the necessary level of tariff, um, how much revenue they need to collect in order to keep services running permanently. And the uh, widespread experience is that water user committees um, often run up against problems that they cannot solve on their own. Um, repairs that they can't manage because they're, they're too technically difficult or too expensive, um, issues to do with supply chains of spare parts, um, or problems uh, within or external to the water user committee, perhaps conflicts or, um, or people simply losing patience with being um, in a voluntary status. Now this next slide um, really, it, it, it doesn't reflect um, hard evidence, but it reflects experience that um, I repeatedly have when I visit and sit with communities, rural communities, but particularly in Africa, and ask them about their revenue collection. And the picture often looks something like this, that there may be 50 or 60 households each agreeing to pay um, some fee towards uh, the, the maintenance of their water point. It might be a few thousand shillings or a few thousand kwacha, um, you know, maybe two or three US dollars equivalent per annum. But on questioning communities in more detail, it often emerges that um, a proportion of the poorer or more vulnerable households are exempted from, from those payments um, for, for very good reasons. But it also emerges that those who are left do not correspondingly pay any more. So there, there's not actually a cross subsidy of the more vulnerable households, um, but simply an exemption. And then the reality is that in, um, particularly in countries which tend to get hit by um, extremes of weather um, or um, agricultural pest attacks, quite often when the harvest fails and there's no significant income in that year, the contributions 
um, either dry up completely or are, are seriously reduced. So it may be that out of that theoretical maximum of, of 120 or so US dollars per year for the community, um, maybe only a quarter of that is, is actually con collected. And that in turn may be only a fraction of what's needed to provide for the routine operation and maintenance of the facility and its eventual replacement. In other words, the full life cycle costs. We have some idea of what those costs are, but of course there's um, hope that the wash cost uh, project will give us a much better handle on those, uh, those figures in different countries. And, and of course, a better handle on the methodology for arriving at those figures. But the consequence of um, um, gathering inadequate tariffs, um, which in the first place are caused by either an inability or an unwillingness to pay, or perhaps a lack of information about how much it's necessary to pay, um, results in a situation where uh, when a major breakdown occurs, um, and the, the repairs are unaffordable, then we see long down times, um, a reinforced unwillingness to pay, and then um, a breakdown of the service. People go back to their original water points, water sources, and they wait for the next, um, the next donor to come along, or the next uh, NGO, or the next uh, government program. So the outcomes of um, this community-managed approach to uh, water point operation and maintenance are seen in part in this kind of uh, data. Um, these are some uh, functionality estimates that were put together by Joe Narkovic um, when he was at WSP and Peter Harvey um, of UNICEF. Um, these figures, I think, are quite well known, but showing that across here, across 20 countries in Africa, um, the weighted average functionality is around 65%. Um, in other words, two-thirds working, one-third not working at any point in time. How you interpret this, I think, depends on your, um, your, your relative level of optimism. Um, a glass half full, a glass half empty. Um, the way I look at it is that the, the fact that two-thirds of hand pumps are functioning is a testament to the success of community management. But the fact that one-third are not can leave us no um, grounds for complacency. Obviously, a lot more needs to be done. Now, that was looking at uh, functionality on a snapshot basis. If you look at the, um, the functionality as, as, a, as a function of age, then um, this diagram, which uh, draws data from six districts in Tanzania, shows um, a half-life of rural water points of somewhere between 10 and 15 years. The data here represent a mixture of technologies, including hand pumps, including um, motorized deep wells, and including gravity schemes. Um, and probably in the case of hand pumps, the half-life, the expected half-life of the uh, technology is a good deal shorter, maybe only uh, five or six years. So the situation that we're faced with today is that, um, as reported in the latest JMP report, um, still 780 million people lack access to an improved water supply service. And five out of six of those live in rural parts of uh, the developing world. Out of those unserved, the 653 unserved um, in rural areas, um, 
about 40% are in sub-Saharan Africa and another 20% or so in South Asia. And it is likely that um, much of the low-hanging fruit, as it were, has already been plucked. In other words, the, the, the easiest to serve people, um, those in the geographical areas that are easiest to get at, um, or living lifestyles that are easiest to serve, probably have been served. And it's likely to be getting more difficult in the future to serve people. Now, the, the title of my presentation referred to the myths of rural water supply. And the reference here is to a paper that the Rural Water Supply Network produced in 2010, which um, takes the reader through seven myths, seven um, common misunderstandings about rural water and the way it's uh, delivered and managed. I just want to pick up on three of these today, which are actually the first three in the paper. Um, but then, if you're interested to follow up um, on the rest, I refer you to that paper, which is on the RWSN website. So the three that I particularly want to focus on, firstly, are that building water supply systems is more important than keeping them working. Secondly, that communities can always manage their facilities on their own. And thirdly, that the best way to utilize public funds is to heavily subsidize hardware. Let's just look at those in turn. Um, building water supply systems is more important than keeping them working. I think as soon as you say it, um, the absurdity of the statement is clear. It's like uh, choosing between food and water, or vice versa, um, which one is more important to sustain life. So it's, in a sense, an absurd statement. But the reality is we act in the sector as though building water supply systems is more important than keeping them working. Most of the public investments and the NGO investments are to do with capital expenditure. They're devoted to the construction of new systems. Furthermore, the, um, the indicators that are used in the sector count people that are using improved water points um, and therefore focus on those, on, on those physical outputs. Governments, too, tend to count the number of new water points which are constructed um, and relate their estimates of uh, coverage to that physical number of uh, new water points. And we're not very good at measuring and reporting the uh, sustainability, the permanence of the services which are provided. The second of the um, myths that I just want to highlight briefly is that communities can always manage their facilities on their own. Now, that is the assumption that we've made since the early part of the uh, UN water decade of the 1980s. We've used a model um, in which we um, enter a community, whether, the, whether we're government or um, an NGO, an external intervention results in the uh, construction of some physical facilities, the water supply assets. We set up a, a water user committee, um, which is the voluntary um, consumer representative um, agency to manage those water supply assets. And the assumption is that that water user committee is fully competent to manage the service. This is the model that we've used, and it's been widely tested, um, not always well, um, but it has been widely tested, um, but it's been found wanting. And, and particularly over the last five or 10 years, we've been concluding that um, this is not fully fit for purpose um, in the way that we'd hoped it would be. An alternative is to um, 
to, to identify a model which has been referred to as Community Management Plus, which recognizes that water user committees are not fully competent to manage the physical assets under their control. Um, they have a good deal of competence, but sometimes things go wrong. Either within the committee, there might be a conflict, um, there might be a need for additional training, for instance, in bookkeeping. Um, there might be a need for outside assistance in relation to succession planning um, for that water user committee, particularly as people move away or um, lose interest in, in being volu volunteers. And also in relation to the hardware, um, there's often a need for technical assistance, there's a need for support to supply chains and so on. And so external support is needed. The third of the three myths is that the best way to utilize public funds is to heavily subsidize hardware. There are many different options for how public funds and indeed NGO funds can be invested. Um, the first one in my list of four here is that as, as now, um, money, the majority of the public funds invested in the rural water sector go to um, capital expenditure. A second option is that we should um, move to a model where there's more co-financing of, um, of the upfront costs with consumers. So a subsidy, yes, but to a lower level or indeed going to the full extent of encouraging household investments but with no hardware subsidy whatsoever um, and that's now being referred to as accelerated self-supply um, and, it, and it's a, an approach that's happening in a number of countries and, and being more widely promoted. Third option for investment, public investment, and which of course is, is going on um, to some extent, is the development of capacity for um, all the supporting services that are needed to ensure that the um, water supply service which is put in place is of the highest quality. Um, so investigation, uh, construction supervision and more general contract management. But I think the crucial thing for me is the fourth one on the list here, getting a better balance between the um, investments that public authorities make um, in capital expenditure and in the uh, post-construction or recurrent investments. The diagram here shows um, the results of a model, um, quite a simple model really, applied to um, a country which now has a population of about 30 million people. Um, and if you look at the, the blue line on this diagram, um, we can see the population projections on the left-hand axis um, taking that population of 30 million now to about 100 million by 2050. It's a country with a high population growth rate, a high fertility rate. If you look at the black line, um, what's included in the model here is um, continued funding of capital expenditure for the unserved um, population. Um, so there's adequate expenditure on capital investment for the unserved, but at the same time there's um, adequate and increasing investment in the um, design and construction and supervision costs and the um, operation and maintenance um, and uh, capital maintenance um, costs post-construction. The black line shows coverage on the right-hand axis um, rising steadily, reaching close to 100% before taking a, a small dip, um, which is mostly to do with the assumptions in the model. 
In contrast, the red line shows continuing capital investment at the same level as the black line, but with um, a serious neglect to the um, operation and maintenance or recurrent expenditures. Um, and what happens then is that coverage on the right-hand axis rises to a level in the mid-60s percent and then starts to fall after that uh, initial um, plateau um, and we start to see coverage actually declining. I wonder whether the, um, the, the claim that the water target has been met um, will still stand in 2015 and 2020 or whether we are going to see slippage um, from that achievement um, which is one to be celebrated but um, not to be taken for granted. Let me turn attention for a moment to um, what it is that I think we should be trying to deliver in rural water. I think there are, there are six things that people want from their water supply service and I would argue that this set of six attributes applies as much to rural consumers in Africa and Asia and Latin America as it does to urban consumers in Europe, North America and uh, the other high income parts of the world. We want access, um, we, we want water supply close to our homes or in our homes. It's only through access that we can um, take sufficient quantity of water. If a water point is too far away, people will simply not carry large quantities home. Um, it's fairly obvious why. We want quality, but quality, water quality is only one of six aspects and people's aspirations around water quality um, are generally around the aesthetic aspects, um, taste, smell, appearance, um, and they may often be less concerned about uh, microbiological contamination or, or other um, chemical toxins um, unless they're very um, well aware of the importance of those aspects and unless the other five dimensions, the other five attributes are already fully addressed. The fourth attribute is that of reliability. People need predictable services and they need a permanent service. The service needs to come at an affordable price, but also not just in cash terms, but the management burden um, on the consumers needs to be within, the, uh, within their capability and their willingness. Um, so participation and community management is fine, um, but there are limits to that. Now it's quite interesting if you compare these six attributes to the um, uh, statements which are coming out of the human rights discourse, uh, the human right to water. Um, the words in the general comment 15 refer to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically accessible and affordable water. The things that are missing, I think, from that are a very explicit focus on reliability, sustainability, permanence, whatever word you want to choose. There is a hint at it in, in the word continuous that occurs in, in um, some of the explanatory wording. Um, but there is no reference at all to the management burden. And I think this is something which perhaps needs to um, come into that statement. So my argument from this slide is that our program design criteria need to be very much more consumer focused um, than they have been, not primarily health driven um, because as with sanitation, as, as with hygiene, for the consumer the main focus is not around health um, but it's around convenience and predictability um, and sustainability of service 
And as I've said, the um, I think there's work to do on the um, the attributes that should be included in the human right to water. So where do we go from here? Um, do we do, as some would argue, um, and go for a complete change, um, a revolution, if you like? Well, I don't. Um, I would argue that community management has achieved a lot. Community management plus can achieve more. Um, but beyond that, there are a number of alternative management models which need to be applied at scale. I'll say more about those briefly in a moment. What needs to change for me is um, to start from two principles, which I sum up in the phrase, uh, for all, for good. Um, for all meaning inclusive um, of, of all members of a community or communities within a country. For good, meaning the time dimension, um, the sustainability of service, the permanence of that service. In the situations, the many situations where community management is still appropriate and possible, um, I think it's become very clear that that needs to be backed up with a greater strength of external support, uh, particularly from local government, um, perhaps in conjunction with the local private sector. There are other models, and I'll come on to those uh, very shortly. We do need to find um, better financing solutions for the um, maintenance and the post-construction uh, costs. That may be through solutions that address the, um, uh, the poverty of communities. Um, it may include cost sharing where that's necessary between community tariffs and external um, uh, financial inputs. It's really important that national monitoring um, captures not just the, um, the, the output indicators, the, the numbers of water points constructed, the numbers of people served, but it includes also um, these key aspects of sustainability and inclusion. Um, we're not a government organization, but within WaterAid, we've just started rolling out across all our country programs um, a model of post-implementation monitoring in which we look back over 10 years since schemes were constructed, um, looking at a few uh, key indicators of inclusion and sustainability. And it would be great to see that um, happening more widely um, at national level. We need to be planning for permanence right from the outset. Um, and that affects everything uh, that's included in the design of projects and programs, um, the technology, the management and financing systems, um, and the monitoring arrangements. The outcomes should be what drives us. And I've suggested at the bottom of this slide um, perhaps a little bit controversially, but I, I'm saying don't let's get too distracted by the impacts, the wider impacts that we're looking for, um, socioeconomic and health impacts. They're hard to measure, they're expensive to measure, they may only be small, um, and they're not necessarily the primary driver for extending service coverage. There are other good reasons for um, getting services to people and maintaining them in the long term. So let's be measuring outcomes rather than impacts. Let me talk about, um, just very briefly, about five um, alternative models of um, rural water supply service provision. First of all, self-supply, or what's now beginning to be called accelerated self-supply, um, in which we recognize that households and communities are already um, taking steps to improve their water supply services. 
um, and they can be encouraged to do more. More households, more communities um, can be brought into this model um, with technical assistance but without a hardware subsidy. And in rural water terms, in a sense, this is the equivalent of what's become the most common approach now to sanitation promotion, and that is community-led total sanitation, where um, the emphasis is entirely on promotion and um, with, with no hardware subsidy um, in, in the pure form of the approach. The second model I've already talked about, um, Community Management Plus. Um, community management, um, not just paying lip service to the principles of community management, but doing it well, doing it thoroughly, um, and adequately supporting it through local government. Um, if necessary, with a degree of co-financing um, for the post-construction costs. Um, we have a webinar coming up in this series on April the 24th um, when I think you'll be able to learn a lot more about an example of this approach. And I should have mentioned in relation to the previous slide um, that there's another webinar coming up in June um, on the topic of self-supply um, when um, you'll be able to learn more about that in detail. And again, um, a topic of a future um, presentation in this series, um, standalone systems. Um, the example here is the Grundfos Lifelink system, um, but there are a few others too. Um, systems which um, operate as uh, standalone um, water supply and usually water treatment um, methods often using solar pumping, using smart cards for payment. Um, the question here, I guess, is um, whether such, um, such a model can adequately um, include the poorest members um, who are otherwise unable to pay. A third approach, um, or sorry, a fourth approach is um, to look towards private operators, um, particularly of large gravity schemes and um, multiple um, motorized pumped groundwater schemes, where there may well be a mix of water point committees, um, scheme management committees, um, perhaps with private operators or private operators who have a foot in the community and, and therefore retain some trust, um, which there may not be in a fully independent um, private operator. That's been a, a point that's been um, identified in a number of uh, recent studies of um, private operator um, services. And the final um, model, um, is really to, to, to look forward and, and say that rural, um, the rural sector or subsector needs to learn from the successes of the urban uh, water provision. Um, and the boundaries perhaps need to be blurred between urban and rural. In, in many developing countries, the um, urban and rural services are quite distinct, provided by different institutions. Um, and I think increasingly in the future, we're going to have to see a blurring of that distinction. Um, and the best practices of um, successful urban operations being used in um, rural water supply services. So finally, uh, final slide. Um, just looking to the future, it seems to me that we need to be looking for professionalization of rural water in two senses. One is around the, um, the people, the individuals, their knowledge, their exposure, their opportunities, their certification, their recognition, um, and their continued learning and professional development. So there's that aspect of professionalization, which I think is, is really important. 
The second aspect is a move, an evolution away from community management towards professionally run operating entities which may be um, primarily in the private sector or, um, or represent some um, hybrid of, of private and um, community-based organizations. We need to see the management burden on consumers reduced, um, but while assuring the standard of the service that those consumers uh, enjoy. And we need tariff structures which uh, recognize um, the fact that some people will always be unable um, to, to pay. And that means that services cannot focus solely on the poor or the poorest. Um, clearly, they shouldn't focus only on the rich. Um, to get any possibility of cross-subsidy, we need to be including all, all wealth categories. So let me leave it at that. Um, I do hope there'll be some uh, good interaction and discussion now. Um, thank you very much for, um, for listening. I trust that you've heard everything I said, um, but um, it's over to you now, I think, and, and first of all to our discussants. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, you've laid the foundation for a very interesting discussion. And I also have to say um, you're an excellent presenter. I'm sure that Cranfield University, you have many adoring uh, students and alumni um, for somebody that's so adept at giving lectures. So let us turn to the discussants. And let me give um, more of an introduction uh, to them. Uh, our first discussant will be Otto Brown. Otto works here in the World Bank as a sector manager for water in the Middle East and North Africa region. He's responsible for water resources management, water supply and sanitation services, and irrigation development in this region. His portfolio has a size of $2 billion US dollars with 24 projects in eight countries. Otto himself has over 20 years' experience in the Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, this experience spans institutional reforms, including institutional diagnosis, private sector participation in utilities, rural and municipal services, community management and innovative financing of service delivery, and waste and environmental service management. Otto has also been involved in several pioneering global efforts to use sector-wide approaches to planning, which means using national systems and budget support rather, rather, than, uh, rather than traditional uh, lending to provide in infrastructure. So Otto, I now will mute my microphone and turn the um, session over to you. Thank you very much, um, um, Professor and uh, Elizabeth. Uh, for you know, it's always a challenge to follow uh, a professor, you know, of uh, high caliber like uh, uh, Professor Carter. Uh, from where I, I come from, uh, we refer to professors as only very learned people or magicians, and it seems that. Uh, Professor Carter is both. I mean, he's kind of um, uh, done very justice to uh, the subject. Uh, and it, it puts me at a very disadvantage in terms of how to respond and, and uh, discuss the subject. I, I will, I think, start by saying that the very takeaway message that I get from um, um, the, the presentation is that the need to build on what has gone before, not to discard. I think that, that is a very important um, uh, um, you know, statement uh, coming from the accumulated experience of raw water supply uh, over uh, the years. And I will try to use uh, a system of um, cards, uh, not, not at the professor, green, yellow, and red, not issuing a, um, um, a red card at the professor, 
but just uh, to to take uh, uh, the, 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 this car system uh, as a way of going through the presentation and offering my perspectives. Um, one, uh, the green la the green card is that there's good news um, that you know over 30, 40 years of very formal raw water supply across the, the world, uh, we, we, we can celebrate something, you know, that the glass is more than half full, uh, that 65% of functionality across the board uh, is, is good news, and that even functionality uh, of systems uh, can go over 10 years, I mean, 7 to 10 years or 5 to 10 years, I think that's a good, good, good uh, basis to build on. It, it doesn't tell the full story, uh, but it, it, it's something that practitioners in this field can take comfort that the efforts over the last 30, 40 years uh, has borne some produce. I mean, and, and that there's still room um, to, um, you know, to, to, to improve the services. Uh, I then turn on to the yellow card, and that deals with the alternative model that the professor suggested. I think I would say at best that these are not alternative services but are complements to the conventional system. And complement because there's a now a recognition of the wide spectrum of rural settlements, that those that are close to urban and those that are uh, single family dwellings um, 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 on their farms and so on. So I think the, the, the spectrum of alternative models can be applied to the different segments of rural people and whether it's well, if it's urban, you can use an, a, 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 a um, kind of a, a downgraded urban model for small towns or uh, big villages, or uh, use a you know private sector for some segment of the market that can are uh, close to private sector and can benefit from private sector. You can use a self supply for isolated settlements that lend themselves um, from um, um, to th this application. And you can blend. I, I think that the message I I, I I want to say is that it's um it, it's it's a, there's no one size fits all. And I think the more we understand the segmentation of the rural uh, space, I think we can apply different uh, models for different segments of the population. I think the other issue that I wanted to I put on the yellow card list was the the design for permanence. I, I think it's it's a far stretch in my my understand that um, um, if 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 we, we 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 it's a good concept, but in practice, uh, if you try to design for permanence, you might lock yourself into uh, the the best being the enemy of the good. And I think that we need to take these evolutionary trends. In some cases, you can apply some revolutionary trends with ICT and design for some sustained uh, engagement of the community and. Uh, private sector support for uh, management, uh, as, as, as the case may be. But, you know, I, I think that the, 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 we need to discuss maybe further the issue of the design for permanence and make it more ap appropriate to, to the subject. On, on my red card list is the last slide in terms of the future directions. And, I, you know, I, I think the professor will have a chance to maybe expand a bit on uh, what he means by professionalizing the industry or professionalizing the service provision. I, I think that's it's, it's important, but um, I feel, I mean, you know, that there's still a lot more to be done on rural water supply. And I work for the World Bank and I see increasingly a decrease in investment in rural water supply as if uh, the battle is already won. And I, I think that this webinar experience will be very important in highlighting that we still have uh, our business to do. And, 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 and I think that uh, just keeping this webinar process going might help highlight uh, to governments, uh, policymakers, um, de development partners, and so on, that the agenda is still there. And I think that agenda, in terms of the maintenance agenda, is very key. I mean, you know, unfortunately, uh, we don't see even uh, exemplary practice in urban water supply. So maybe I think people in the rural family could say that okay, communities are uh, are better left alone than being promised by utility or government that could do even worse. 
but I, I think there's still room uh, to engage on the uh, maintenance. But I think one subject I think that I want to bring to the table is looking at planning from a district or local government base. You know, because when you when you when if you don't plan from a governance framework, you have a situation where you target only uh, new systems as against supporting systems uh, that are already in place. And it's a, it's a human nature. If a politician or a government official or policymaker or even a donor or NGO wants to provide service, they will always go to those who don't have and not worry about those who have. But I think that a more, uh, um, what you call it, um, comprehensive approach to planning at, 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 the, at the local level uh, will provide opportunities to plan projects or programs that combine those who don't have and those who have but need management support to uh, help them through the maintenance. And um, I think the, the role of a private sector where it exists, or role of different, uh, I think we need to think about innovation, like every Coca-Cola cooling box, box, no matter where, how rural the settlement is, gets maintained. And I think that we need to uh, sharpen the, the market to 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 uh, attract you know innovative management systems from the private sector that can help or the non-private sector that can help uh, improve the art of maintenance in the system and I think that we have an excellent opportunity with especially um, uh, ICT availability of ICT cell phones everywhere to improve the monitoring and to improve monitoring not for the sake of bashing the government. It, that the government is not doing its work, but monitoring that allows communities to take action or allows the private sector to respond to community action. So I think that we should use a lot of the innovations in applied technology in ICT uh, to improve also a visibility of the subject uh, as well as a response by the development community on the subject. Thank you. Sorry, I had a momentary lapse of getting my microphone back on. Uh, thank you very much, Otto. Uh, that's a lot of um, material that you covered there. So Richard, I would like to ask you to respond to um, whichever of those uh, remarks you'd like to, to respond to before we move on to Sam's comments. Take it away, Richard. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Otto, uh, for, for those comments, uh, very helpful ones. Um, I'll, I'll keep mine brief so that others can contribute as well. Um, I will just address three points, I think. Um, you picked up on design for permanence and whether that's realistic, possibly the best being the enemy of the good. Um, my argument here is that whatever um, technology is put in place in the first place, it is completely irrelevant whether that technology goes on working for five years, 15 years, or, or 25 years. What is important, what's essential, it seems to me, though, is whether the water continues to flow. And once a community has received an improved service, um, then to go back to using literally the swamp, the river, the unprotected source, I think is, is an unacceptable um, uh, retrograde step. And that, that's really what I meant by designing for permanence. Our management systems, our financing systems, um, and to some extent our technologies need to be such that the water can continue to flow and that there's a, a very high probability of that. Um, so that hopefully that's just clarified that a little bit. You also referred to planning at the district or local government level, to which I, I would absolutely agree. Um, and, and I think the, the gist of that argument is that if we don't focus on both the served and the unserved, and if we don't focus on both the, the relatively wealthy and the poor, then we, we won't make much progress. We need the wealthy and the poor to have any possibility of cross-subsidy. We need to focus on the served as well as the unserved. 
because if if the water supply to the the communities that we're counting as served, if they're going out of operation as quickly as new ones are coming in, then um, we're, we're clearly um, in danger of slippage. So I fully concur with what you say about that local government district level planning and, and the crucial um, importance of uh, local government capacity to do that. Um, together with other players, um, particularly non-government organizations, um, fitting into and supporting local government planning um, procedures. And then just finally, on monitoring, um, I, I agree there too. It, it, monitoring is so important not to not to bash governments, not to, we, we tend to get involved so much in this language of holding governments to account. Um, to me, it's not so much about that. It's about um, improving performance. If we don't measure, we can't manage. And, and it's as simple as that. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, Richard, and, and Otto as well. Now let me um, introduce uh, Sam Mutono to you a little bit better. Uh, it's with special pleasure that I introduce Sam because I've known him for over 20 years. Sam has 26 years experience in the water supply and sanitation sector. He began his career with the government of Uganda in what is now the Ministry of Water and Environment. When I first met Sam, he was the manager of one of Uganda's largest rural water supply and sanitation programs that was covering all of southeastern Uganda. Sam eventually left the ministry to become a program officer in the Danish embassy in Uganda. And then in 2005, the water and sanitation program had the good fortune to recruit Sam as its Uganda country coordinator. Sam is also, I believe, the acting rural water supply team leader for the water and sanitation program in Africa. So Sam, with that very brief introduction, I turn the microphone over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thanks to, to Richard and Otto Brown after such a seniors talking, uh, it's very difficult to find something to, to say. Uh, but uh, also going by the things I clearly agree with is that uh, we need to focus more on uh, the long-term sustainability of the facilities. We need to uh, professionalize this, the, this, the sector. We need also to improve on what we have done so far, which has clearly achieved results. In Uganda, I know we are also rethinking the community-based maintenance system, but uh, when we started, the functionality was uh, less than 40 percent, but now we can talk of functionality of, of, of over 80 percent. So it has definitely made a big uh, impact in Uganda. And I think what we need to do is how to improve it. But as, as we go along, there are certain things uh, within the short time pass which I should mention. Uh, for example, we are emphasizing the permanence of the source. One of the things which is coming, becoming very apparent in Uganda is the declining water resources, the groundwater and the, even the surface water. It is very apparent in the urban water supplies and we are having, I think, some of the springs and gravity schemes uh, with reduced tea, uh, yields. And what is becoming very clear is that uh, as we do this permanence, we need also to look at the source. And I think in the sector here in Uganda, it has been decided uh, that, uh, especially for the large utilities, that source protection is taken into account when investments are made. Uh, 
just to make sure that the water is also available both the quality and the, and the quantity to the extent possible uh, uh, of course clearly the, the, the thing of uh, leveraging resources from the users and beneficiaries I fully agree but of course we have political economy issues in some countries where we have paternalistic approaches to development and we need to be very innovative on how we can do some of these things at scale. Perhaps not so many countries are affected by this but some countries like in Uganda we have that challenge and we have to find innovative ways uh, of doing it. Uh, another issue which I need to point out is that he, sometimes operation and maintenance is also the sentiment of affected by the governance issues. Uh, for example, in Uganda we carried out uh, an integrity, integrity study, a baseline set on integrity, and one of the findings that was that only 3% of the response, respondents reported that they trusted their water user committees were using the maintenance fee correctly. So part of the challenges may be arising from that uh, lack of confidence in the user committees. And this arises perhaps because we have not had uh, adequate backup support to, to make sure that this accountability uh, feedback to the users is done by the water user committees. So as we also we need also to look at these governance issues uh, as a, as we push for, uh, try to maintain the operation and maintain uh, promote the community based maintenance system or whatever. But also we are also arguing for professionalization, private sector participation to improve service delivery. But we have to be mindful that we need also to have a strong public sector and also we need to develop a regulation. Otherwise, we might end up in a much more difficult situation than we find ourselves in. So uh, all these need to be taken into account. How we attract more resources for operation and maintenance is a challenge. I know my colleague Ato worked so hard here to advocate for increasing resources, for example, for setting up a unit for operation and maintenance for urban or increasing resource allocation, but is uh, quite a challenge and is normally grossly understaffed for reasons which have been discussed, that it is more uh, vote catching to mention that you have uh, uh, you have done new facilities than uh, than uh, trying to say you have maintained facilities. And even the local government level in Uganda, for example, the ministry sends the, or the government sends grants to the local governments for implementation. And a certain percentage is supposed to be allocated to the software, the community mobilization, the training of committees, the water user committees, and so forth. But sometimes some local governments, councils, decide that for them they want to only facilities and they leave no money for doing these very high, very important aspects which are important for operation and maintenance. So again there are, there are a lot of challenges which have to find out how this can be addressed. And we are also focusing, so uh, the professor mentioned about the quality. Again I want to go back to the project which Liz mentioned which we worked on in the 90s. One of the things which came up consistently and I don't think has been addressed yet that in the over 80 percent of the cases the water was clean at the point of source by the by time of a point of of taking it at home drinking it it would be contaminated in well over 300 percent so again these are some of the things we need to take into account if we are focusing on achieving the full benefits uh, of the investments that we are making and the efforts that we are putting in. I think uh, in view of the time and to allow others to also contribute, I want to stop here and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. And because um, the, the time has grown so short, I won't ask Richard to respond to your or comment on your uh, remarks and instead we'll move to uh, question and answers. Our 
facilitators have already been uh, collecting many of your questions and comments that you've been putting in the, the chat box. So I will ask them in turn to um, read out uh, some uh, questions. Uh, Joy, can I ask you to give the first uh, question or comments to Richard? My first question, Richard, is um, as we move away from the low-hanging fruit to more remote and less accessible consumers, We're asking uh, uh, Joy to turn up her volume. Just bear with us a minute. Um, so she'll, she'll repeat that question in just a minute. Is this better? Much better, much better. So the first question is, as we move away from the low-hanging fruit to more remote and less accessible consumers, we need to have reasonably priced solutions for self-supply. What can this community do to make sure that solutions are available? Okay, thank you for that. Sh shall I respond now, Elizabeth? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I would particularly highlight um, um, two, two areas that um, are, are certainly very promising and, and where a good deal of work has already been done. Um, one is around rainwater harvesting, um, where, where the conditions are suitable for that. Um, and Likewise, where, where conditions are uh, suitable, where groundwater is sufficiently shallow um, and, and accessible, manual drilling um, can offer opportunities for quite low-cost interventions which can serve um, either individual households or small groups of households. Um, but those are just two examples of, of, of others. Um, thank you. Sean, do you want to pick a question from our chat box and feed it to Richard? Thanks. Right. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Very good volume, at least for me. Okay, good. Okay, there's um, a lot of interest in subsidies for self-supply and uh, whether you think there is a role for um, any s subsidies in the self-supply issue. Thank you, Sean. Yes, and I, I could see it was difficult to keep tabs on everything that was going on, but I saw in the chat that uh, Sally Sutton had uh, um, put a comment um, suggesting that self-supply does not always need to be completely subsidy-free. Um, certainly, any approach to the promotion of self-supply or the acceleration of self-supply in, inherently involves a subsidy in the, the sense that the promotion costs have to be paid for. Um, whether there's also a hardware subsidy to the, um, the households that invest in such improvements, um, I think is debatable. It's much clearer cut to um, argue for no subsidy whatsoever, um, and there are many examples where that has been quite successful. Um, but there may well be cases where a subsidy is is justifiable, and um, even within a community, um, I've seen examples where the um, the wealthier members, slightly wealthier members of the community, will cross subsidise the really destitute um, in improvements to their rainwater harvesting, for example. Um, so I'm not um, totally adamant about self-supply having no subsidy um, whatsoever, um, but I think the principle that it should be a small part of the total investment is, is the right one. Um, thank you very much, Richard. Joy, our next question. Sure. Um, so our next question is for Sam. Uh, Sam, what is the degree of governance issues related to technical ones? Sam, did you get that? Not, You're being called clear, upon. But what yes. I can say, yeah, I, I, I saw the question, but it was not clear. But uh, the technical issues to do with the governance is actually, for example, in the local government, 
is the supervision, contract supervision and the management. I think uh, in areas where, for example, the people issuing the tenders have been compromised, you find they will not mind so much about the quality of the product and, the, and the sustainability also is affected by the, the quality of the facilities constructed. I don't know whether that uh, can be given as an example of the technical issue in, in governance. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sean? Right, next Would you like question, to read your next question out? Thanks. Yes, it's a interesting one, which is how can one keep trained rural folk from leaving water projects and joining a company in urban areas for greener pastures? And that's to Richard. I, I Richard was afraid that one ahead. might. Yeah, I was afraid that one might be to me. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. Um, <laughs> I, th I think it's inevitable until until services, um, health services, education, um, transport services, all all the things that people want to and, and quite legitimately want to enjoy, until those services um, are available in rural areas, I guess there will always be a pull towards uh, the urban centres. Um, and, and it does represent a, a challenge for any sector of rural development, whether it's in, in water or agriculture or, or anything else, health, education. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, and the reason I say that is because I don't see that anybody has yet solved it. Um, if you have a, a very strong internal motivation and, and drive to serve rural people and rural communities, then you will stay and do that. Um, if that motivation is less strong, then the city may pull too hard. Uh, thank you. Joy? Uh, this question is for Richard. Richard, the typical definition of access any LPD per person less than 30 minutes old. Does not fit well with the, with your slide about what did you get her? Are you losing? I, I missed the second part. Um, the the definition of access you were saying, Joy. I'm afraid we seem to have lost Joy. At least half of us have lost Joy's um, audio. So Sean, could I ask you to read out a question while um, we see if Joy's comes back on? Okay. Um, I think this this question is quite close to my heart, which is uh, about IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, and whether it has a, a role in rural water supply, especially given the scarcity of water sources, competing users, uncoordinated, uncoordinated donor investment, and the need for prioritizing use of scarce resources. So I'd like to direct that one actually to to Sam and what what he feels the role of IWRM is in, in rural water supply. I, you, is that for, for Sam? Yes, sorry, Sam. I do in the rural water supply. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is becoming, especially as in some of our places, as the population pressure increases, that the original cheap groundwater sources are getting contaminated because the catchment area around the Beat Spring or Borehole area is being uh, not is not properly protected. In some cases, I mean, people uh, they cultivate very close to it. In some cases, it might be construction as people build houses and the toilets end up contaminating the water facilities or the human activities around the catchment is affecting the quality and the quantity of the water. So that is why I mean integrated water resources management can 
assist in trying to ensure that the the the, the, the sources are secured, both in terms of the quantity and the quality. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we only have time for one more question in order to keep to our time schedule. And I believe we have restored the audio with Joy. So Joy, could you pick out that final question? Sure. Um, so the final question is, is the role of government and rural water management reducing and so what are the implications? Yeah, I think... Or yeah. Take it away, sure. Richard. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, no, I'll, I'll pick that one up um, and, and really support a point that Sam made about um, the importance of, of uh, strength and capacity in the public sector, the private sector, um, among communities of consumers and in the regulatory functions of, um, of nations. Um, I think what we've learned from, from the last 20 or 30 years of engagement in rural water is that um, it's not a question of either or. Um, part of the motivation, I think, and some would say cynically, um, most of the motivation for community management has been uh, or was initially a response to weakness in government. Government can't deliver, therefore community must manage. Now, that may be quite a cynical approach, um, but it's, it's clearly flawed because you need strong government to support, and particularly strong local government, to support strong communities. If the private sector is involved, you need strong local government um, to um, establish contracts and to manage contracts with the private sector who in turn also need to be strong. And then the, the regulatory function um, Sam referred to is, is fundamental too. So it's not a question of either or. Um, I think all the um, players need to be um, equally strong and, and complementary um, in, in improving water supply services. Um, thank you very much, Richard. And unfortunately, I have to rush us to our uh, closing in order to more or less keep time. So thank you to everybody. Um, this has been a wonderful launch to our rural water supply. I'd like to thank all of the participants, particularly the ones in East Asia who, for whom it must be the middle of the night. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, thanks, Richard, Otto, and Sam. Uh, thanks, Joy and Sean, for facilitating the question and answer period. And double thanks to Su Jung for uh, managing this whole Adobe Connect. You will all receive an email from us uh, by tomorrow about next week's webinar. If you click on the Get More Information button in that email, it will take you to the web page for the webinar series. And there you will be able to find a recording for each webinar. The recording for today's webinar should be posted within a few hours. And you will also find copies of Richard's PowerPoints there and the RWSN publication entitled Myths of Rural Water Supply. Next week's webinar will feature a presentation on the challenges facing rural water supply and sanitation in Latin America in the coming decade. We would really, really like to get a global perspective on this by having participants from around the world. So we very much hope that you can join us next Tuesday, and of course, every Tuesday for the coming 10 weeks. So saying goodbye from Washington, DC, and see you next week. <laughs>